All righty, welcome, welcome. We'll go ahead and grab a seat. Sorry, we're a few minutes behind. I'm having a few technical difficulties. It looks like our, our live stream may not be working tonight. So if you know of anybody who is watching the live stream, if they text you, hey, it's not running, uh, please let them know that we are recording our, uh, our service tonight and we'll post it later. So uh, the, they will be able to uh, hear it at least after we're done here. Welcome. So glad you guys are here. If you're a guest with us tonight, thank you so much for being here. I want to encourage and invite you to come by our visitor table over here uh, by the parking lot. Uh, if it's your first time visiting us, we'd love for you to grab a little gift that we have for you. Uh, also, there are Bibles over there, so if you need a Bible, uh, we have some bottles of water if anybody needs that. So uh, please uh, just swing by our visitor table before you leave. I uh, want to remind you that uh, we are promoting Manifest this month, uh, which is uh, a ministry that, because we care ministries down in Nicaragua, does every year, uh, where they fill their, their big, this big room full of food uh, that gets distributed to villages all around Nicaragua. And so we want to encourage you guys uh, to give to that. Uh, every bit of the, the money that is donated will go to directly to buying food that's going to be delivered uh, via the team uh, because, because We Care Ministries. Uh, and, and people are going to get fed. Uh, people who are in real need are going to get fed, and, and they're going to get fed the gospel as well. And so I encourage you, you can do that online. There's a place for you to designate that, or if you want to write a, a check or, or cash, just make sure you designate it for uh, either manifest or because we care ministries and we'll make sure we get that to the right place um, and if you want to do that there's an offering box over here on that table that's also where you can worship the Lord through your giving one more announcement and then we're going to stand and sing some worship songs together this is an exciting one in a couple weeks on October 18th we're going to be doing a baptism Woo! yeah there you go uh, now, whether that baptism is out here or inside has a lot to do with how the Lord blesses us that day with weather, so that's going to be a game time decision, but uh, we want all of you guys uh, to be praying uh, for Kate and Stephen as they prepare to, to publicly proclaim their faith in Jesus Christ through baptism that day, so it's going to be awesome. Just circle uh, that on your calendars. All right, guys. Oh, and one, one more uh, housekeeping note. You are welcome to go right through this door by me while I'm preaching. You will not disturb me. I live with children. I have to do everything in a distracted way, okay? Uh, you can go right through there to the bathrooms. If you're not comfortable with that, the door around here down the steps is propped open. I just ask you to, to, when you leave, to make sure you keep that propped open if somebody wants to go around that way to the restrooms inside here. All right, well, let's stand and uh, let's read some scripture and praise the Lord together in song. Our uh, text uh, that we're going to read before the service this morning or this evening is Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Uh, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Let's sing together. You set us up. You set above all the stars you set us on a high place by where you are and while we were dead you made us your friends and scattered our dead upon the to one God's murdered son who paid for my resurrection 
Once from the dust. Once from the dust. And once from the grave. Daughters and sons from the ashes you raised. And hidden our faults, even from your own face. And scattered our dead upon. murdered son who paid for my resurrection oh glory to one God's murdered son who paid for my resurrection glory to the one Wow. 
might as And when before the throne I stand, and when before the throne I stand in Him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat, that Jesus paid, that Jesus paid it all. and stain he washed it white as snow sin had left sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow he washed it white as snow Sing and praise, so oh, praise the one. a crimson stain he washed it white as snow amen let's pray really quick heavenly father lord we just thank you for the words we just sang and heard from romans 5 lord god we have life in you through christ um praise the one who paid our debt because of our sin and through Jesus we have new life God um, the old has passed away um, God you've removed our hearts of stone given us a heart of flesh if we are in Christ um, and we can cling to that this morning God I pray that you would teach us in first Samuel this morning um, just your provision Lord how and how you made that possible um, in David's kingship and ultimately through Christ. Um, we love you, Lord, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We may go take a seat and continue to bow your heads. We're going to enter in time of uh, pastoral prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, God, again, you Lord, are amazing. Thank you, Lord God, for who you are. You are a holy and just God. And a God abounding in mercy and grace, Lord. Mercy and grace, Lord, that we uh, can never know the entirety of how much grace and mercy you have for us, Lord. For us as sinners, Lord, as, as, as people, Lord, who have been 
separated from you, Lord, but purchased by the blood of your son, Jesus, Lord. Like the song we sang, Lord, Jesus did pay it all. He has paid it all, Lord. God, Lord, I want to pray, God, um, one, just for this evening, Lord, but also I just want to uh, pray, God, for uh, those around us in College Park and in PG County, Lord God, um, who do not know the gospel, who do not know the good news, Lord, of what your son did on the cross, the life he lived, Lord, for for us, so that we may be redeemed as brothers and sisters, as, as children, sons and daughters of God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that that you wouldn't just call them, Lord, to you, Lord, but God, you would use us here, God. You would use us at Aletheia College Park, each individual one of us, Lord, in our context as God, to, to reach the lost, to be a light and a salt to the earth, God, that, that more and more people could come to know your name. God, Lord, I pray that you give us strength, Lord, and wisdom and grace and mercy and meekfulness, Lord, um, as we talk to people, Lord. May we not, Lord, be people, God, who shy away and, and, and live in fear, God, of being rejected, God, to, due to your good news, Lord. And I just don't pray this, Lord, God, for College Park, Lord, but I pray it for Maryland and I pray it for the United States, God, um, through other church plants and, and other Christians around the world, Lord, and, and even in places like Nicaragua, Lord, our brothers and sisters down there. God, I pray for this evening, Lord. Uh, I just pray for your word, God. I pray that you use Rob, Lord, to speak through him, God, to us. Open our eyes and our hearts, God. Pierce, Lord, our, our hearts and the darkness of it, Lord, where, where sin may lie, God. And may your light, God, just flood into that place and, and, and transform, God, our lives to be uh, sons and daughters that are more like Christ, Lord. God, we love you, and we just pray all these things in your son's holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, guys, for leading us in song. If you have your Bibles with you, and I hope you brought them to church with you, I want you to turn with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 20. As we continue our walk through this wonderful little Old Testament book. I'll never forget that night in those woods. Those woods in western North Carolina where I grew up with that group of friends who gathered every weekend that summer to go camping and enjoy some good old country fun, running our trucks through the mud and you know, lighting a fire and just enjoying fellowship overnight as we camped out. But that night, things weren't right. See, this group of friends had formed around Jesus. Our friendship was solidified in Christ, but it had become abundantly clear that night that a good number of our friend group had slowly but surely begun to drift away from the Lord. And that night, it had become very evident by their behavior. In fact, it seemed that night that the only people that it bothered was me and my best friend Dwight. Put on top of that, the fact that my best friend Dwight at the time was going through personal crisis in his personal life, and we, it was a heavy night. And so we decided to take a walk in the woods in the middle of the night. We grabbed our flashlight, and we took off into the wilderness. And we talked, and we walked, and we prayed, and we found a little soft spot in the woods where we could look up and see the stars in a way that you can only see out in the country. And we poured our hearts out to God that night, and we wept together. Our hearts were heavy. After we prayed, we just sat there in silence, and this breeze came over us. And I don't want to spiritualize or romanticize that, but, but there was something in that moment that filled us with peace that's hard to describe because we knew two things in that moment. Even in our heaviness that night, we knew we had each other. Two brothers in arms. We weren't going to abandon each other. We were going to walk locked arm in arm in our faith with Jesus together. And we knew that God had us. 
It was in those two truths that we, we had peace that night. And that night would become a pattern for our friendship. In fact, that was one of many nights that the two of us would cry out to God together, oftentimes with tears in our eyes. It was a special friendship, to say the least. In fact, it still is to this day. I was back home a few weeks ago, my brother's passing, and I got to spend some precious moments with my old friend. Now, those are the kinds of friendships, aren't they, that most of us long for. And when we come to 1 Samuel chapter 20, we get to take a glimpse into one of the most famous friendships in all of the Bible. That is the friendship of David and Jonathan. And we're going to get a snapshot, if you will, of this amazing friendship in this text. But I, I, want, us, I want us to be careful tonight. Because there are indeed things that we can learn about being good biblical friends from this text. But I don't think that's the point of 1 Samuel chapter 20. In fact, I think the point of this text tonight is to direct our hearts to something even greater than friendship. And that is to direct our hearts toward the beauty and the power of this thing called a covenant. And my, my hope here tonight is that we will leave this evening and have a, a greater appreciation for the idea of what a covenant is and that we'll see that that ultimate expression of covenant love is found in none other but Jesus Christ our Savior. It's kind of lengthy, but I'm going to read the entirety of chapter 20, 42 verses. So, I'm going to ask you to do your best to stick with me here. If you've got to stand up and wiggle, I don't care, all right? Uh, but we're going to read it, starting in verse 1. It said, Then David fled from Naoth in Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, what have I done? What is my guilt? And what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And he said to him, Far from it. You shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. And why should my father hide this from me? It is not so. But David vowed again, saying, Your father knows well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he thinks, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. David said to Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit at table with the king. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field till the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked me to leave to, uh, of me to run to Bethlehem, his city. For there's a yearly sacrifice there for all the clan. And if he says, good, it will be well with your servant. But if he's angry, then you will know that harm is determined by him. Therefore, deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. But if there's guilt in me, kill me yourself, for why should you bring me to your father? Jonathan said, Far be it from you. If I knew that it was determined by my father to har uh, that harm should come to you, would I not tell you? And then David said to Jonathan, Well, who will tell me if your father answers you roughly? And Jonathan said to David, Come, let us go out into the field. So they both went out into the field. And Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day, behold, if, it, if he is well disposed towards David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But should it please my father to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan and more also if I do not disclose it to you and send you away, that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. If I am still alive... Show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever. When the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David and David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Then Jonathan said to him, Tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed, because your seat will be empty. On the third day, go down quickly to the place where you hid yourself when the matter was in hand, and remain beside the stone heap. And I will shoot three arrows to the side of it, as though I shot at a mark. 
And behold, I will send the young man saying, go find the arrows. And if I say to the young man, look, the arrows are on this side of you. Take them. Then you are to come for as the Lord lives, it is safe for you and there is no danger. But if I say to the youth, look, the arrows are beyond you then go for the Lord has sent you away. And as for the matter for which you and I have spoken, behold, the Lord is between you and me forever. So David hid himself in the field. And when the new moon came, the king sat down to eat food. The king sat on his seat as is other times on the seat by the wall. Jonathan sat opposite and Abner sat by Saul's side. But David's place was empty. Yet Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought, ah, something's happened to him. He's not clean. Surely he's not clean. But on the second day after the new moon, David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, why has not the son of Jesse come to the mill, either yesterday or today? Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. He said, let me go, for our clan holds a sacrifice in the city. And my brother has commanded me to be there. So now, if I found favor in your eyes, let me get away and see my brothers. For this reason, he has not come to the king's table. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Then Jonathan answered Saul, his father, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. And Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger ate no food the second day of the month for he was grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. In the morning, Jonathan went out into the field to the appointment with David and with him a little boy. And he said to his boy, run and find the arrows that I shoot. As the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the boy came to the place of the arrow and that Jonathan shot, Jonathan called after the boy and said, is not the arrow beyond you? And Jonathan called after the boy, hurry, be quick. Do not stay. So Jonathan's boy gathered up the arrows and came to his master, but the boy knew nothing. Only Jonathan and David knew the matter. And Jonathan gave his weapons to his boy, and he said to him, Go and carry them to the city. And as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap, and he fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. And they kissed one another and wept with one another, David weeping the most. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace. Because we have sworn, both of us, in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be between me and you, and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went to the city. Let's pray. God, thank you for this text. It's beautiful. And I pray that you would speak the beauty of it straight to the depths of our heart, Lord. I pray that your word would penetrate like a sword, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would help those in this hearing who are believers in Christ to respond, whether it be a repentance or a call to obedience or whether it be to rest in a promise. And I pray if there's someone here today listening to this message that is not saved, that never put their faith in you, Lord, that they would receive salvation, the gift of salvation today. Lord, do it for the glory of your name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All righty. Let's note a couple structural components of this text, because it's a lot, right? 42 verses here. Let's note a couple, a couple things that I think will help us nail down the main idea. First of all, let's look at the bookends of the chapter. It begins with verse 1, saying that David fled to Naoth. Or, or, excuse me, he fled to Jonathan from Naoth. And then the book ends with David departing once again. Now, it says depart there, but we can read between the lines and the circumstance. He's fleeing again, right? This, of course, is going to be the common theme for the rest of this book. And so we have bookends, if you will, of, of David fleeing. It seems, therefore, that there's something 
uh, that the author is trying to bring to bear here on the theme of the Lord's anointed fleeing and seeking refuge, constantly seeking refuge. And then sandwiched in between those two bookends is a repeated theme in each section, and that is the theme of covenant. Now, maybe you caught it or maybe you didn't there, but let's just briefly look at it and then we'll really dig into it. You see, first of all, there in verse 8, David appeals to Jonathan based upon the covenant that they had made. You remember back in chapter 18. We see then in verses 14 through 17, once again, Jonathan asking for a renewal of and really an extension of their covenant. It's restated once again in verse 23. And then when we get to the dinner table scene, it's not explicitly stated here. And yet what we do have is Saul making a reference, a very clear reference to Jonathan's choosing of the son of Jesse which, of course, should call our minds to the cost of the covenant because him choosing David meant he was denying his path to the throne. And then the chapter ends with them once again departing uh, uh, from one another and confirming this covenant commitment that they'd made for one another. Therefore, it seems really clear to me as I read this text that, that this, that's the main idea here. What dominates this chapter is the idea of covenant as a means of safety. That's the backdrop. He's, he's trying to seek safety and refuge, and he finds it in this chapter in covenant. All right? Now, of course, this is a covenant between two men, David and Jonathan, two friends in this case. But, but church, it is this covenant relationship I think that we, the church, are intended to see as a metaphor, as a shadow, as so much of the Old Testament is, of the covenant that we have in Christ, who, ironically enough, if we're going to go with the theme of friendship, is called a friend of sinners. We're going to reflect, therefore, on a few important aspects of this very important biblical theme of covenant. So here's your main idea. It's short and sweet. It's this. The cost of covenant commitment is worth the safety of covenant love. So let's just walk through the text and note four aspects of a covenant that we would do well to both know church and to live in day by day. First of all, Notice the refuge of covenant love. Again, set the scene. Verse 1, David fled from Naoth in Ramah, and he came, and he said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is my guilt? And what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? So remind, let's remind ourselves where we were last week. Saul is pursuing David. He pursues him all the way to this little prophet of, uh, community of prophets in, uh, called Naoth. And the Lord thwarts it, right? The Spirit came upon his messengers. The Spirit comes upon Saul, and he prophesies naked. Now, that was a very strange passage indeed that we talked about. But, but it was a picture, if you remember, of God incapacitating Saul here so that he may not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now, we know this was about a 24-hour episode because it said explicitly in the text that he lay there all day and all night. But it seems here David isn't taking any chances. He's not going to take any chances that Saul at any moment might come to his senses, snap out of it, and seize him. And so now he's on the run once again. This is sort of akin to the movie The Fugitive. Anybody ever seen The Fugitive? It's the biblical version of The Fugitive. David, much like Harrison Ford in that movie, is always running and he's always trying to bring his innocence to the light. And so that's what he does. He flees. And here he flees to Jonathan. And he pleads his case with him. Three questions. What have I done? What is my guilt? What is my sin? And I think David knows he hasn't sinned against Saul, but, but he's lamenting to his friend here. Why? Help me see, brother. Why is this happening to me? Why is your father trying to kill me? And Jonathan seems oblivious to his plight. Now, we might be reading this going, what, why? How in the world could he be oblivious to this? I mean, Jonathan's response to David's questions here is something like, what the heck are you talking about? I know nothing about this. Now, Saul, of course, is no dummy. He knows how Jonathan feels about David, and he's kept this whole pursuit of him secret. In fact, the last in interaction that we know of that Jonathan had with his father was when he spoke to him and saw his father vowed. Remember that? He made a vow before the Lord that he would not harm or hurt David. 
Jonathan, I think, is a little bit like me. Jonathan's a half full, cup, cup half full kind of guy. He's going to assume the best in his father, not the worst in his father. And so he assumes that his dad's going to stick with the vow he made from the Lord. So he responds to David by saying, far from it. But David then persists by giving a vow of his own. He says, your dad knows how you feel about me. He's kept his intentions for me. And then he says this, but as truly as the Lord lives and as your soul lives. That's vow language. There is but a step between me and death. So what's now Mr. Cup Half Full going to do? He's got the vow of his father. He's got the vow of David. And they now seem to be in conflict. Well, Jonathan holds to his commitment to David here, doesn't he? And he says, whatever you want, I will do. So David devises this plan. Oh, the timing is perfect, right? It's the new moon, which, which doesn't mean a whole lot to us, but that biblically what that meant is there were feasts and there were festivals to the Lord and there were the kind of feasts and festivals where the whole king, the, the king's family was expected to be present at, which would, of course, include David because David was the king's son-in-law, Right? And so David says to Jonathan, hey, I'm not going to be there because your father's trying to kill me. And when your dad asks why I'm uh, not there, tell him this. Tell him that I needed to go back to my hometown because we were doing a sacrifice there. And if your dad is okay and he's okay with that answer, then maybe I'm just being delusional and paranoid. And I'll be safe and I can come back. But if he gets angry, then you'll know that he wants to kill me. Now, what's the point of this first section? Well, certainly we're continuing to unfold the plot of the story here, but the point, I believe, in this first section is the appeal of David in verse 8. You see, it's kind of odd in some respect that David would flee for refuge to Jonathan. I mean, yes, Jonathan's his friend, But Jonathan also would be in proximity to his father Saul. This was the son of his enemy here. This was a a risky move in in many ways. If you're watching this movie, you're probably yelling at the TV, Don't do it, David! Don't go to Jonathan! I know he's your boy, but blood's thicker than water. You can't trust family like that. Like, please, don't run to him. And yet, in this instance... It is David's instinct to run to Jonathan. Why? Well, it's because he feels safety there. And it's a safety, my friends, that moves well beyond the trust of a a close friend. I think that he feels safe here, not because of their friendship, but because of their covenant relationship. Listen, Listen carefully to how he appeals to Jonathan here. He says in verse 8, Therefore, deal kindly with your servant. For you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. But if there is guilt in me, kill me yourself. For why should you bring me to your father? He says, Jonathan, deal kindly with me. That word kindly is a really important word in the Bible. It is a prevalent word in the Hebrew. It's the Hebrew word hesed. It's it's a word that's used almost 250 times in the Old Testament. And even though it's used a lot, it's almost untranslatable into English. In fact, if you read this word over and over again, you'll get all kinds of different translations of the word. Sometimes it's translated as love, sometimes as mercy, sometimes as kindness, as we have here, or loving kindness. Sometimes as grace, sometimes as loyalty. Certainly we can see loyalty here. What what does this word mean? Well, I love the way the Old Testament uh, scholar, the British Old Testament scholar Norman Saith defines hesed. Now here he's talking about God's hesed for his people. He says this, God's loving kindness, and that's the word, the Hebrew word, is that sure love which will not let Israel go. Not Israel's, all of Israel's persistent waywardness could ever destroy it. Though Israel be faithless, yet God remains faithful still. This steady, persistent refusal of God to wash his hands of wayward Israel is the essential meaning of the Hebrew word which is translated loving kindness or kindly in our context. In other words, guys, chesed is covenant love. 
covenant kindness. And that's what David's appealing to. Hear that. He's not appealing to an emotional connection with Jonathan. He's not appealing to a rational conclusion that he thinks he can convince Jonathan of here. No, he's appealing to the covering of covenant love. That unique kind of love that combines warmth and loyalty with faithfulness and compassion. David appeals in his fear, Jonathan, show me chesed for, why? For you have brought me into a covenant. Covenant relationships produces security. That's why, by the way, it's a little side note, but that's why sexual intimacy, which is by far the most vulnerable and powerful of all the expressions of love, is designed by God to take place in the safety of covenant marriage. That's why God designed it there, not to steal your joy, but to allow you to enjoy that in the safety of covenant. So why did David run to a potentially dangerous spot? Because it was there that he could take refuge in the safety of that covenant love. Friends, how instructive is this to us? Christians. We live in a world that is full of brokenness and uncertainty, a topsy-turvy world, if you will. We are hard-pressed on every side. In the words of the Apostle Paul, we are afflicted but not crushed. We are perplexed but not driven to despair. We are persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Why? Because we have the refuge of the covenant love of our God through His Son, Jesus Christ. The kind of love that will never forsake us. The kind of love and commitment that will hold us in the storm. That's that, my friends, is where we must run when life closes in on us. That is where we must run when we are confused and hurting and pressed in this life. We must run to the promises of Hesed, of the new covenant in Christ. Which is something we're going to meditate on and celebrate in a moment. When we come to the table, the Lord's table. So, covenant is a place of refuge. But secondly, notice here that the the release of covenant commitments. David says, okay, great. How are we going to know the results of this test? So Jonathan says, "Let's, let's go out in the field and have a talk. Seems like a lot of the dialogue in this text happens out in the field, doesn't it? Now, This story, strangely enough, could really easily omit verses 12 through 17. They're really unnecessary for just the plot here, right? Now you could seamlessly jump from verse 11, how how am I going to know what happened at the dinner table, to verse 18. Here's how. Here's our little cloak and dagger thing. In fact, verses 12 through 17 almost interrupt the flow a little bit. But that probably means they're really important. Jonathan says, the Lord God of Israel be witness. So now he's putting himself here under the accountability of God. God be witness. I'm going to reveal to you what I find out about my father's intentions, he says. And he says, may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. Now, that probably doesn't shock most of us when we read it, but that is a shocking statement. In, a, in that little statement there, may the Lord be with you as he's been with my father, Jonathan is essentially once again, now, now with his words, releasing his self-rights. The crown prince here is seeing something in the future, and as we pointed out in chapter 18, he is submit, submitting himself to a future reality. John Woodhouse comments on this text. He says, this is astonishing. The Lord had been with Saul for the purpose of his being king. He had been the one the Lord had chosen. So for Jonathan to ask that the Lord be with David as he had been with Saul was to ask that David should be king. Such incredible self-denial. And this is what covenant relationships look like. This is what a covenant relationship looks like. That's the nature of covenant relationships. Deference and dying to self. That's true for any of you who are married or aspiring someday to be married. And it's true of the Christian. 
It's important here, Jonathan is not just acknowledging it. In that statement, he seems to be asking God to accomplish it. It's like the Christian praying, not begrudgingly, but joyfully, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then, in an ironic turnabout in this particular story, remember, David's fled to Jonathan. It seems here now that Jonathan turns to David for refuge. Notice in verses 14 through 17, Jonathan releases his self-reliance. Look, look, look at, at 14 through 17. He says, if I am still alive, in light of this declaration that you're going to be king, if I am still alive, show me the steadfast love, there's that word again, has said, steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. And do not cut off your steadfast love for my house forever. When the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Jonathan says, Hey, if it's true that my father intends to harm you, I'll warn you, David, so that you can be safe as an expression of my committed covenant to you. But let's extend this commitment. I'm going to be faithful right now, trusting that you're going to be faithful in the future. If I'm alive when you become king, then please spare me. And, and, and if I'm not, then please do not cut off my family. You see, in, in those days, if a new king from a different bloodline came into the kingship, well, it was just good politics to wipe out any potential threat from the family that was on the throne, that previously on the throne. Right? You wouldn't just dispose of the king or even the next in line. You would wipe out his whole family. You've probably watched movies where that's happened before. You know, that was a safety measure for your newly acquired throne. So Jonathan asked here, hey, when you come to your kingship, don't do that to me. He's asking, you see this? He's now asking for covenant covering from that kind of eradication. Now we know David is going to honor that covering. If you read ahead to 2 Samuel Chapter 9, chapter 21, you'll find David, who at that point is the clear king of Israel, not just sparing, but seeking out in order to show mercy, Mephibosheth, uh, Jonathan's only surviving son who was crippled in the flight during the chaos that happened in the exchange of the kingdom there, right? That in itself, by the way, is a beautiful gospel picture of God's redemption, his, his pursuit of helpless enemies of him. But here, let's just marvel at Jonathan's faith for a moment. The writer of the book of Hebrews says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Is that not what beautifully is being modeled here by Jonathan? At this moment, his father's still in charge. David's on the run, but here he is taking pres risk in the present that he might have safety in the future. He is dying to self in the present that he might be saved in the future. You see, that's what faith does. It acts in the now because of the assurance of what lies ahead, even though it's not yet seen. Jonathan's living in light of a future kingdom, David's kingdom. Is that not how we, brothers and sisters in Christ, ought to live our lives? Denying our supposed rights in this present world with eyes toward a future kingdom. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things in the present will be taken care of. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust can destroy and thieves can come in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. In other words, have eyes that look forward to my future kingdom. Jonathan treasured David and he treasured David's kingdom more than he tre treasured his own comfort his own family comfort and his own kingdom we too brothers and sisters in Christ are called to treasure Christ and his kingdom which is far better than anything right in front of us so we see the release of covenant commitment notice thirdly here the resistance to covenant relationship Jonathan gives David a plan for the reveal, a field, an arrow, some, uh, you know, a little boy. 
real this is sort of like kind of ancient cloak and dagger secret communication stuff and now it was time to put the plan into motion so they come to the table and david's seat is empty on day one saul sort of explains it away he's like well he he must be unclean that's sure that's the only reason he's not here like he 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 should be here but on the second day he begins to question jonathan about david's absence and jonathan says exactly what david had told him to and saul well this is putting it lightly he exploded didn't he if there's anything consistent in saul's life it's his temper it's his rage in fact he's so mad here he brings his wife into the conversation you son of a perverse rebellious woman do i not know that you have chosen the son of jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness for as long as the son of jesse lives on the earth neither you nor your kingdom shall be established therefore bring him to me for he shall die david's words are confirmed saul lashes out at jonathan and he, expl- he states explicitly now his desire to kill Jonathan. There's no questioning at this point. Now, let's note Saul's rational conclusions. Even in his temper here, he has some rational conclusions, right? At least rational in terms of earthly wisdom. Saul's essentially saying to Jonathan, you're such an idiot. Hey, don't you see what you're doing? You're shaming your family origin by choosing him over us. That's what it's meant there to the shame of your mother's nakedness. And secondly, as long as, don't, Jonathan, don't open your eyes. Don't you know as long as David's alive, your hopes for the kingdom are dead? That, what, that wasn't slander. That was true. As the devotion to David meant a rejection of his father and a rejection of any ambition that he might have to sit on the throne. Right? But it was a cost that Jonathan here was willing to pay. He stands up for a David. He essentially asks the same questions David asked. Why do you want to kill him? What has he done? And at that moment, if the words weren't enough, the truth was solidified by action. Saul, who's always got his spear with him, now hurls it at his own son, Jonathan. Saul and his spear work again. Now it's Jonathan, his son, who's the object of this attack. That's a helpful association for us, by the way. Jonathan because of his covenant relationship and commitment to David, is now experiencing the very same hostility that David experienced. That sound familiar to anyone? Jesus said, did he not? In John 15, 20. <laughs> I'm going to let those get by. In John 15, 20, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Guys, we we shouldn't be surprised ever in our lives when the world casts at us the hostility it really feels for Christ. There will always be resistance where there is covenant. But note Jonathan's choice. Saul rightly said, you have chosen the son of Jesse because Jonathan gets up and leaves. One commentator noted that this mill started with an empty, with David's seat empty, and it ended with John's, Jonathan's seat empty as well. That, that's that's a that's a good picture, a helpful picture for us. You see, his commitment cost him a seat at Saul's table, but it would later give his offspring a seat at David's table. See, when you think of go and read in Second Samuel, Mephibosheth is not only spared Jonathan's son; he sits at the king's table always. So too. That is us. Our commitment to Jesus in this world might indeed lose us a seat at the world's table. But by God's grace, we will be invited to the Lord's table. We have been invited to the Lord's table. We will eat, Revelation 19, this great feast before the Lord. So we've asked that question over and over again in in this book. Is Jesus worth it? He is. He is. So we've noted the refuge of covenant love, the release of covenant commitment, the resistance to covenant relationship. Finally, one more. Look at the rest we find of covenant peace. The rest of this chapter plays out part two of their plan. Jonathan takes a boy out into the field. He shoots the arrows. He says the code words, the arrows are beyond you. In other words, get out of Dodge, David. 
That was a signal. You're right. My father wants to kill you. You need to run. Now, I was talking about this this morning with Preston. Like, you read this chapter, you're like, what's the point of this plan if right after this they're going to talk in the field here, right? Well, it may be that he took the lad out to the field with him as a, a way to kind of cover an alibi, so to speak. Or it may be that that was the intention, that as soon as you hear the code word, just take off and run. But in that moment, they were just overcome with the idea that this may be the last time that they ever see each other. And they just couldn't resist taking the risk to see one another one more time. All right? So when the coast is clear, David comes out of hiding. And briefly here, these two friends have this gut-wrenching response to the situation. Note here the pain of their broken circumstance. David, it says, fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times, and they kissed one another and wept with one another, David weeping the most. His two friends just cried together, anguish. They were weeping about how things had turned out. David weeping the most. He had no hostility toward Jonathan or, or even Saul, I don't think. And that's evidenced by the fact that he never tries to revolt against him. They wept. Because in this moment, they were feeling the brokenness of sin. And we, we can relate to that, can't we? Now, listen, I want you to hear this. We're never... I don't want you to ever hear this challenge and call to biblical faithfulness as some sort of macho thing, like nothing ever bothers me. I'm faithful to Christ in the storm and I never feel the weight of sin. No, we, we still weep when we experience the hostility to our Savior in this world. We, we grieve the tragedy of a world broken by sin, even as we hope. And that's how this chapter ends. I mean, this chapter ends really oddly if you think about it. Look at verse 42. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, because we have sworn, both of us, in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be between me and you and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Go in peace. That's a strange statement given the circumstances, isn't it? The reality is there was no peace in their circumstances. But that truth did not affect the peace of their covenant relationship. See, they could move forward, both of them, into the suffering that lie ahead with a peace that their relationship and their commitment and their future promises were solidly intact. Dell Davis comments on this. He says, is, is that not an accurate sketch of biblical peace? Biblical peace is not often a general tranquility, but rather a rightness at the center in the midst of turmoil. Paul implied that Christians enjoy peace, Romans 5.1, with God, and at the same time endure afflictions, Romans 5.3. Jesus told his disciples, in me you may have peace, in the world you have, have, will have affliction. The Christian does not have peace because things are peaceful. He has peace because a greater one than Jonathan has pledged his friendship to him. Brothers and sisters, that is the peace of our new covenant. Relationship with Jesus, who is a friend of sinners. If we expect rest and relief from our circumstances, only by relief of our circumstances or a change in our circumstances, we will often find ourselves disappointed, frustrated, restless, distraught. But we can find rest in the chesed of our covenant-keeping God. So where does this text find you tonight? If you're here or you're listening to this on the computer and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian, if you're here and you've never put your faith in Jesus, I want to ask you this. Do you long for the kind of security you witness in this covenant friendship? Is that something you long for? I want you to hear that this picture is meant to point you to the ultimate covenant relationship in the narrative of history. There is no security like the covenant love of Christ. 
There is no commitment stronger than the one that was displayed on the cross when Jesus willingly died to bear the penalty for your sin. There is no result more pleasing, more satisfying than the forever friendship of Jesus, who is the only one who has to be truly and forever and fully faithful. There's no security. There's no security more sure than a covenant uh, that is confirmed by resurrection and sealed by the Holy Spirit. Would you give your life to Christ in faith tonight? Admit your sin and your rebellion and trust his death on the cross and commit your life to him. That is what your soul is longing for. We'd love to help you make that decision. Come talk to us. Pray, we'll pray with you. For my believing brother and sister tonight, let me ask you a few application questions here. Four, real quickly. I'm going to wrap it up, I promise. Number one, where do you flee in hard times? Where do you run? We groan and lament in this world, but my friends, we need not flee to anything beyond the covenant security we have in the new covenant. That's what we're going to meditate on in a moment when we come to the table in communion. Second, what are you struggling to release in order to live in covenant faithfulness to Christ? Do you find yourself at the table of the world choosing or struggling whom you're going to choose? Whom you're going to choose? Is there a particular comfort or a particular practice or some pleasure that you need to let go of through repentance tonight? Three, are you surprised when the world hates you? Are you surprised when we receive the same kind of persecution that our Lord Jesus Christ experienced? We can expect it, can't we? By way of our covenant relationship with Him. That doesn't mean we enjoy it, but we need to come to grips with its reality, right? And we can take heart in the midst of it. I have overcome the world, Jesus said. Fourth, finally, in what ways can we mirror the hesed of God in other covenant relationships in our life? This is immensely practical. We have other covenant relationships. If you're here and you're married, that's a covenant relationship. If you're a member of this church or another church, that's a covenant relationship. These relationships are meant not to just fill us with joy and happiness. They're meant to serve as powerful proclamations of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, are you, my married brother, proclaiming the beauty of covenant by the way you faithfully serve and love and cherish your bride? Vice versa for those wives? What about you, my fellow covenant members here at Aletheia? Are you displaying the gospel Uh, In the way that we love and faithfully rock Philippians 2 and have an other's mentality here in this church. I don't know how God's calling you to respond, but I know that God's calling each of us to respond to His Word tonight. Would you do so? Let's pray. Father, thank You for 1 Samuel chapter 20. Thank You for the truth and the power of a covenant. And I ask, Lord, that you would help those of us who are in this gathering tonight who live under covenant relationship. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to to rest in that, be secure in that, Father. I ask, Lord Jesus, that, that we would seek refuge in nothing else, Lord, that we might rest only in the security of our relationship with you through your Son, Jesus. God, I pray that we, even as we are experiencing uh, the resistance in this world, will hold strong. That we will, not begrudgingly, but willingly and joyfully release our rights and our self-reliance, God, to live in this covenant relationship. And God, may the result be peace. Peace the world knows nothing of. God, I pray for my friend here who doesn't know you. Lord, may today be the day of salvation for him or her. Pray, God, that they would... Stop running. Stop resisting. That they would give their life to you. Lord, move in this this open air worship service tonight. And move for the glory of your name. Amen. Amen.
Let's uh, let's stand and sing together. Be thou uh, my vision.
Go ahead and take a seat. We are now going to prepare to take communion. Uh, and much like baptism, which we're going to celebrate in a few weeks, communion is a gift to the church where baptized believers get to publicly remember Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and probably proclaim that his broken body, which is represented by the bread, and his shed blood, which is represented by the juice, are our only hope for forgiveness.